Today is Mother's Day. It comes every year, and every year preachers everywhere ask themselves, what will I say? What can I say to a sanctuary of hundreds of people who have diverse and complicated relationships with motherhood? I have trouble with Mother's Day for this reason, because it is so fraught with peril, and because its origin as Mother's Day for Peace during the Civil War has largely been forgotten. This year, however, I am encountering this day in a whole new way, as an expectant mother. My wife, Erin, is six months pregnant with twins, a boy and a girl. And for the first time, I am approaching this day seeing myself as a mother. Now, I imagine that you have mixed experiences with this day as well. Some people perhaps chose to stay home today because coming to church on Mother's Day is simply too painful. Those who have lost a child, who've experienced a loss through miscarriage or a failed adoption or children who've left, and those who've struggled with infertility, we are with you, even if you are not sitting here among us today. And some probably come here with hesitation. You who are navigating the challenges of motherhood every day and don't want to hear an overly sentimental Mother's Day message. You who are in mothering roles but wonder whether you will be recognized here. You who have difficult relationships with your mom or have lost your mother. You who have chosen not to be mothers. We see you. And others this morning are here in the spirit of celebration. Those who are pregnant with new life or about to become a parent, and those who became parents recently, some of whom we blessed up here this morning. And those of us with strong relationships to a mother figure in our lives and who want to celebrate them on this day, we celebrate with you. And some of you came simply because it's what you do every Sunday. You came because this is your community, and it is all of our community. Whether you are here often or not, whether you come here this morning with sorrow or with joy in your heart. I want to share a bit of my story with you this morning. A story of the complicated journey to motherhood as an invitation to reflect on your own story. Parts of it may resonate with your experience and parts of it will not. What I've learned thus from it so far, however, are not lessons unique to motherhood. They are life lessons. My wife and I joked recently that parenthood is pending, and yet I'm already learning some practical and spiritual lessons from the process, which I think will serve me well as a mother. I'm learning about the control, or lack thereof, that I have over my own life and the lives of others. I'm learning the lesson that Barbara Kingsolver reflects on in the reading Daniel shared. That as much as we try to control our children, our morning schedule, or what someone wears to school, we will face resistance or even outright civil disobedience. The title of her reading is Civil Disobedience at Breakfast. <laughs> Kingsolver thought that she could show her daughter who was boss. But with the movement of a hand knocking over the orange juice glass, her command was dead. My learning began over a year ago when we started planning to become parents and has been reinforced again and again since. As much as I have wanted control, it has eluded me. The process of getting pregnant for two women is a medical one. We like to think that if it's happening in a doctor's office, we can control what happens quite precisely. When it happens, how it happens, and what the outcome is. Well, we can monitor it to the extreme, but control is a whole nother matter. We carefully chose a donor. Aha, so we're controlling something from the start. <laughs> then month after month, we tried monitoring with sonograms and blood tests with no success. The emotional roller coaster was powerful, from anticipation to disappointment and then summoning the hope to begin again. A few months in, it worked. But then it ended in a miscarriage, 
which left us questioning whether we should continue trying. A couple tries later, the one time that I couldn't be present for the procedure, it worked again. (laughs) The news came on Christmas Eve of all times, after an Advent season of cautious anticipation. A couple weeks later, we went in for a sonogram and discovered that we were going to have triplets. It felt like life was about to spin out of control. We went into a tizzy and started shopping around for bigger cars because that was something we thought we could control at the time. Over the following weeks, we saw that the third one wasn't growing, and we knew that if the pregnancy continued, we would likely become mothers of twins. As sad as we were to lose the third, we felt like we had slightly more control with two. There are two of us, there are two of them, at least we wouldn't be outnumbered. (laughs) Around the same time, we learned that our babies were at risk for a congenital heart defect, in which the electrical system of the heart doesn't develop correctly. Again, there is nothing to control here, only to monitor. And so we are getting to know the dedicated and expert fetal cardiology staff at Children's Medical Center through weekly appointments. So far, the babies are healthy and all is well. And now we are making our way through the changes of pregnancy. Mostly Aaron is, but I'm trying to be as supportive as possible. The lessons in control continued as she experienced the complete and utter exhaustion of the first trimester of pregnancy. Now, I wanted to control how much energy she had. Let's go. Let's do things. Wait, what? You're going to bed at 7 (laughs) p.m.? The hormones overpowered both of us, and we had to surrender to them. I let go of my usual active pace and adjusted to what King Solver called Zen time. (laughs) The whole experience has been incredibly humbling, and the babies aren't even here yet. I've been forced to practice letting go of specific outcomes and timing, and instead dealing with my own outlook and anxiety about how I want things to go. Motherhood is already teaching me that I need to better cultivate and strengthen my ability to learn and grow along this journey that is often beyond my control. Motherhood and parenting don't have one book or manual that states how it will predictably and certainly go, nor does life. The book of life is full of surprises and events and people that are beyond our control. And so the spiritual challenge is to cope with this reality. And this is the point that I think that many of us will connect with, whether we've experienced mothering or not. So many things in our world these days are beyond our control, or at least they feel that way. Decisions are being made by people representing us that affect many of us in deeply personal ways. And the usual channels for affecting change, which should give us some control in the process, are not always working. It leaves us grasping for a sense of certainty and a feeling of agency wherever we can find it or establish it. Haven't you ever desired to control another's feelings or actions? Perhaps a spouse or a child, a friend, or someone you work with. I bet all of us have encountered someone in our life who has evaded control, who, like Barbara Kingsolver's two-year-old daughter, has looked at us coolly and knocked over the OJ class, (laughs) or something like that. Kingsolver acknowledges that her goal is to raise children who grow up to be decision-makers and trendsetters, And so her daughter is on the right track. But she doesn't want her to be that way when she's two years old. Mom is supposed to be in control at that age. I once heard a mother say that she wishes she had a remote control for parenting. Play. Stop. Fast forward through the tough parts. Rewind when you wish you'd done something differently. Pause at the really good and beautiful moments. And I might add, guide, for when you don't know what you're doing. (laughs) And on demand, because we all wish the children would do what we want when we want it, right? (laughs) 
I think that we could all use a remote control for life. In reflecting on the breakfast experience, King Solver writes, we may feel less driven to shape a child in our own image if instead we can shape policy or sheet metal or teach school or boss around an employee or two. Luckiest of all is the novelist, she says. I get to invent people who will live or die on the page, do exactly what I wish because I said so. It sounds like writing is her way of coping. And we find many different ways of coping with uncertainty, change, and lack of control in our lives. Sometimes it's finding the one small thing we can control. Like a mother friend of mine who has the same cereal every morning with coffee in the same mug, no matter what else arises that day and no matter how challenging it is, she knows that she can rely on that morning ritual as an anchor. What we do when we are without a remote control for motherhood or for life is the question that I'm grappling with alongside you today. And I'm learning about it all the time from the process of becoming a mother. To lack control is to be vulnerable. So of course we'd rather have a remote control. Krista Tippett, host of the public radio show On Being, interviewed the Buddhist teacher and writer Sylvia Borstein on spiritual parenting. They talked about vulnerability and about nurture. Tippett, quoting theologian Louis Evely, said that to be a parent or to be in a mothering role is to experience an infinite dependency on an infinitely small, frail being dependent on us and therefore omnipotent over our heart. Evely's words remind me that we are not the ones in control at all. Tippett ponders how to live, how to love, how to know that we can, what we can do and what we can't to raise children who will participate in the world's beauty and pain and be safe inside their skin. This, too, is a conundrum, a daunting challenge that we rarely name together, she says. But it is always there if we are raising children not merely to be successful, but to be good and grounded and kind. When I read Tippett's words, I thought, this is what we're seeking to do at church, raising kids to be good and grounded and kind, whether as a mother or as a church community, like we committed to do today in blessing the children among us. This can teach us profound spiritual lessons for our own adult lives. Wise people, mothers, parents, mentors, and therapists, tell us that we cannot change or control others. We can only change ourselves and our reactions to others. This can be a hard truth to really internalize. But when we have an infinitely small, frail being dependent on us and omnipotent over our heart, we can't ignore it. The poem I read earlier, First Lesson, by Philip Booth, sounds like a message from a parent to their daughter. It is a message about grace, about letting go and knowing that you will be held. First held by the parent who learns that they don't have to be the one keeping all afloat, and then held by the sea. Sometimes we just have to lie back and acknowledge that we are moved and held by forces beyond our body and our being. We have to cultivate this same practice we try to teach children as they grow. How to swim when the tide water is pushing against us. Learning this practice well will help us as parents, as partners and spouses, as friends and co-workers. During last year's journey toward getting pregnant, Aaron and I bought a sign that said, there will be miracles, and hung it in a prominent spot in our home where we would see it every day. When I saw this sign, I knew that the maker probably understood miracles differently than I do, but I gravitated towards it and the hope and possibility it expresses with the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson in the back of my mind. He talked about a miracle not as a supernatural or unlikely occurrence, but as the most common of wonders, like the falling rain and the blowing clover. Miracles are something natural. They are life. 
And we can't make them happen, nor are they totally beyond explanation. Looking at this sign every day gave me some hope that life would happen, regardless of how we tried to steer it or bring it into being. And little did we know that miracles would happen. Miracles with an S. <laughs> the fact that any of us have made it this far in life is a miracle. The fact that we are here at all. And motherhood, whether by giving birth or by taking on the role of mothering in someone's life, is a miracle as well. In all its many forms represented in this sanctuary and in our communities. If we reflect on our experience of mothering from whatever vantage point we find ourselves in, I think we'll find that when we try to control too tightly through expectations or limitations, we diminish the possibilities for what could be. Today is an invitation as well to express our gratitude for the mother figures in our lives who have kept us afloat and then let us go. May we do the same in hopes of creating good and grounded and kind people, our children and ourselves. May it be so. Amen.